Let me correct my script there. So. It's good. I, I missed this. And so I'm glad you're all here. And I'm glad you're joining us online. I encourage you to come when you feel comfortable and, and be with us. You know, John Wesley, the 18th century theologian, was about 21 years of age when he went to Oxford University. Wesley came from a Christian home. He was gifted with a keen mind and good looks. But in those days, as a young man, he also was known as a bit snobbish and sarcastic. I wouldn't understand that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one night, something happened to Wesley that set in motion a change in his heart forever. While he was speaking with a porter, a guy schlepping his luggage, he discovered the poor fellow only had one coat, and he was so impoverished that he lived in such bad conditions he didn't even have a bed to sleep on. Yet he was an unusually happy person, and he's filled with gratitude to God, talking about God all the time. Wesley, hearing the man's story and being an immature person, thought thoughtlessly joked about the situation. He said sarcastically, what else do you thank God for? But the man smiled, and in the spirit of meekness, he gave his reply. He said, I thank him that he's given me my life and, a, and being and a heart to love him, and most importantly, that he's given me a heart to serve him. The answer was like a gut punch to Wesley. He asked the question to elicit a laugh, and instead he got a lesson. He got a lesson that he would never forget. The man's reply deeply moved Wesley, who recognized this poor man knew far more about the true meaning of thankfulness than he did. The lesson of praising God in every circumstance never left Wesley, and it guided the rest of his life. And many years later, in 1791, as he was on his deathbed at the age of 88, John Wesley, despite his extreme weakness, surrounded by his family and his friends, began to sing the last song that he would sing in this life, the old hymn, I'll Praise My Maker While I've Breath. Today, I want to talk to you about the power of praise. And let me be clear, I'm referring to the power of praising God. Praise is a crucial but often overlooked tool in the life of a Christian, a life of a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, over the last couple of weeks, I've talked to you about the necessity and the urgency of living our faith fearlessly and out loud, and how God has positioned His church in this time and this place to begin a forceful advancement of His kingdom in this world. And I want you to see today's message as a kind of a, here's a tool, here's a weapon that we as followers of Jesus Christ have in our arsenal and have at our disposal that we can use in accomplishing the advance of the kingdom of God on earth. Because when we as his children genuinely praise God, we release the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Genuine praise is a dinner bell of sorts to people who are hungry to hear the gospel. And our praise, your praise, my praise, our praise together has the power to shake the earth. It has the power to change the spiritual atmosphere in which we breathe. Did you know that? It does. It absolutely, most certainly does. Which begs the question, if praising God has that kind of power, how come we're not constantly doing it? Why aren't our lives being changed by the power of our praising God? Why aren't people hearing our praise and having their lives changed by the power of God? Those are good questions. Questions I hope each of us will think about, ponder, consider as the next few days come along. Do you know we're commanded to praise God? We are. Psalm 150 Pretty much makes that clear. Let's read it. In fact, open your Bibles to Psalm 150. You at home, open your Bible there too. Psalm 150. It's the last psalm in the Bible, in the book of the Psalms. And just like Psalm 1, which opens this wonderful collection of songs and poems and praise to God, Psalm 150 is only six verses long. But these are six powerful verses, and they don't need a lot of interpreting. Here's what Psalm 150 says. You ready? It says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, 
Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Any questions? <laughs> the psalmist is extremely clear. He's telling us we need to praise God everywhere, all the time, with everything, anything that's at our disposal. Do you have breath? The Bible says you need to use that breath to praise the Lord. I used to think, wow, this guy, God, he's got some ego. He needs our praise all the time. Why does he need our praise so much? I used to think that. I was thinking wrong, really wrong. Listen, God doesn't need anything from us. God is totally self-existent, self-sustaining, self-sufficient. Paul says in Acts 17, 24, and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. God doesn't need anything from us. Zero, zilch, zip, nada, squadoosh. Bet you never thought you'd hear squadoosh in a sermon, huh? <laughs> Just another service I provide. So if God doesn't need our praise, why does he want us to praise him? The answer is found in the next two verses of that passage in Acts. Let me read them to you, verses 26 and 27. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Listen to verse 27 one more time. God did this so men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. God wants us to praise him, not because it stokes some oversized ego that he's got. God wants our praise because our praise is an important part, an important aspect of us reaching out to God and drawing other people to God. Let's take a moment to talk about what praise is, biblical praise, the kind we're called to give God. Biblical praise is more than a compliment. I like your hat. That's a compliment. I like your mask. A lot of people have really cool masks anymore. But that's not praise. That's a compliment. Biblical praise is made up of two major components, gratitude and joy. Praise is our response to God, who he is, what he's done, what he's promised to do. Praise is, and I wish I knew who said it first because I totally would give them credit, because it's an often awesome definition. Praise is the voice of faith. How about that? Praise is the voice of faith. Praise is what your faith sounds like. Let that roll around your head for a minute. And while you do, turn your Bibles to Psalm 34, a great example of praise there. One that really underscores the truth that praise is truly what your faith sounds like. Psalm 34, starting in verse 1. This is a neat psalm. Of course, all the psalms are neat. But this one I particularly like because the origin of this psalm is written right above the psalm. We can see what motivated David when he wrote it. And that's cool. That's important. Your Bible might say something slightly different, but the version of the Bible that I'm using says this. A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. This is referring to a story in 1 Samuel chapter 20 where David, on the run from King Saul, who's trying to kill him, runs to Gath. And that turns out to be kind of a dumb mistake because Gath is a Philistine city and the Philistines hate Israel and the Israelites. They're literally, they're arch enemies. And to make things worse, David goes to Gath with Goliath's sword. And he's recognized by the people who were quick to point out to Achish, that's the city's king, hey, this is the guy who's killed thousands, tens of thousands of our guys. David now realizes he made a mistake, so he fakes like he's crazy. 
He, he scribbles on the city gates and lets drool come down his beard. And then when David is brought before Achish, the king says, don't we have enough crazy people of our own that you've got to bring me one more? Get him out of here. And so David, they let David go, and he escapes to the cave of Agilu, where he's thinking, man, that was close. I could have been killed, God. I was an idiot, and you saved me. And that's what prompts David to come up with Psalm 34. I want to read the first three verses, and that's going to be the text for this message. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Can't you just hear the praise oozing in those three verses? In those three verses, David, who is overcome with gratitude to God, is praising God and recognizing what God has done in saving him from a self-inflicted, crazy, dangerous situation. And he shares six practical ways that he's using to praise God, and he invites us to share with him in those ways. You see them? Six ways. The first one is bless. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. We're all familiar with the ways that God blesses us. We all love that God blesses us, but do you know that you can bless God? How about that? 36 times in Scripture, we're called to bless the Lord, and we can bless the Lord. Bless means, among other things, to honor, to make happy, to thankfully praise. And if you're honoring God, you're making God happy. And if you're making God happy, that's honoring God. And if you're thankfully praising God, that honors God and makes Him happy and blesses God. You can bless God. How about that? The second one is pretty straightforward. David uses the word praise. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. David is saying, I'm going to speak God's praise out loud where it can be heard. More specifically, the Hebrew word for praise that David uses in this psalm means a song of praise. David says, I'm constantly going to be singing God's praise. When Sam was little, I would sing to him. That's the first time he came to visit me in my office at Channel 2. I would sing to him. I would make up songs to him. When I was around him, I just wanted to sing to him. Parents understand that? One song went like this. I love you. I love you. I think the whole world of you. I love you. I love you. You're my little boy. And at the end, Sam would always say, cha-cha-cha. I still sing to him, only now it embarrasses him. He's sitting right there, and he's probably embarrassed. He probably couldn't get lower in his seat right now. But you know what? I don't care if I embarrass him. I don't care if I embarrass me. I want that boy to always know that his daddy loves him. I need him to know that his daddy always loves him. I don't know what it is with children, but with my look at Sam and realize when I have him the first time that I've always loved him with our children and staring at him like that. That's when I really understand forever like I've never understood it before. So I need him to know that. I need to share him that. Share him with, share with him that. And that's what David means when he says, his praise shall be continually in my mouth. David is saying, God is always going to know how I feel about him. And so is anybody else in the area. I love that. That's good stuff. It's important stuff. Remember at the beginning of this message, I said our praise has the power to shake the earth, our power, the power to change the spiritual atmosphere in which we breathe. Remember that? I wasn't exaggerating. Keep your finger in Psalm 34, but turn your, in your Bibles to Acts 16. This is the story of Paul and Silas. They've been beaten. They're thrown into jail. They're locked in the stocks. I'm sure they're uncomfortable as all get out. It's the middle of the night. And poor Silas, this is his first missionary trip. He probably is wondering, oh, well, this is how I figured it was going to go. So he looks over to Paul and he says, what do we do now? And Paul, the grizzled missionary veteran, that great man of God says, there's only one thing we can do, boy. We sing. 
And what happens next? It's there in verses 25 and 26. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God, and then God shows up in a mighty fashion, shaking the chains off the prisoners and opening the prison doors. All the other prisoners were listening. They were listening while Paul and Silas were singing praises to God, when suddenly they became witnesses to the power of that praise, and because of that, the Bible says a whole lot of people got saved that night. Our praise has the power to shake the earth and change the spiritual atmosphere in which we breathe. It absolutely does. Okay, back to Psalm 34. David praises God by blessing him and by singing praise to him. What else? Well, in verse 2, it says, My soul will make, may make my boast in the Lord. My soul will make my boast in the Lord. Boasting. How many of you grew up with this? Don't boast. Nobody likes a braggart. Well, it's true. No one wants to hear somebody bragging about what they can do, what they've already done. No one wants to hear about bragging about their date last night or their amazing investment. No one wants to hear about somebody bragging about their latest job promotion or their new car. James 4.16 says that kind of boasting is evil. But as wrong as it is to boast about yourself, it is that right to boast about God. God tells us in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts about, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. In Psalm 34, David says his soul is going to make its boast in the Lord. In verse 4, he actually does that. David says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And delivered me from all my fears. Now that's a boast. And loved ones, that's a boast we can make too. It's a boast we should make too. Imagine when something happens in your life that's hard. Something that makes people around you take notice. They can ask you, why did you handle that situation like that? How could you handle that situation like that? And you can say, your response can be, I was able to respond like that because I called on God. God loves me, and I love God, and God answered me, and he took care of me, and he gave me the strength to respond in grace and mercy because that's how my God treats me, and that's how my God can treat you. What a testimony that is. What an earth-shakingly awesome praise. David says he'll bless God, he'll praise God, he'll boast in God. And when he does, David says, the humble will hear and rejoice. That's the next way David praises God, rejoicing. Did you know when you made the decision to follow Jesus, he not only gave you life, eternal life, he put inside of your heart this deep and endless well of joy. And because he did, God has equipped you to and expects you to do this thing called rejoicing. Like, let that joy bubble up out of your heart over and over again. But the sin in our lives, the doubt, the worry, the fear, all the other junk that we uh, focus on instead of God, it clogs up that well and chokes off our ability to rejoice. It's not supposed to be that way. God doesn't want our joy choked off. That's why in Psalm 51, 12, with David, who's seeking God's forgiveness for having an affair with Bathsheba and having her husband murdered, he implores God to restore to me the joy of your salvation. Rejoicing is a powerful tool that we as followers of Jesus Christ have. Nehemiah 8.10 tells us, the joy of the Lord is your, amen, strength. In Philippians 4, 4, Paul exhorts us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And you know what? Paul wrote that in prison. And that's important for us to take note of. Paul wasn't on vacation in the Bahamas when he wrote that psalm. He was probably locked up in the stocks again. He was imprisoned. But he was able to rejoice 
God wants you to rejoice in him always. That means in the good times, that means in the bad times. God, when it's easy, when it's hard. When rejoicing is the last thing on your mind. David mentions that in Psalm 34. Look again in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. At all times. Those are three critically crucial, powerful, victorious words that we as followers of Jesus Christ need to know, need to live at all times. That means rejoicing when things are going your way and rejoicing when you get hit by a bus. Now, don't get me wrong. God isn't asking us to rejoice because we got hit by a bus. But when you get hit by a bus, and I hope none of you do, God wants you to look past your situation and put your focus and keep your focus on him. He wants you to say something like, God, I just got hit by a bus. It hurts a lot. But even though my body is broken and I'm in pain and I don't know how I'm ever going to recover from this, this I do know. I know that you are still God. You still love me. Your promises are still good and you promised to take care of me. And you said you're going to take, work all things for good, together for good for those who love you. So I thank you and I praise you and I rejoice in, that in, in you for that. I rejoice for who you are. That's good. <laughs> That's what Paul meant in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 when he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. There is no strength in your circumstance. There's only strength in God, and when we focus on him, our circumstances, no matter what they are, what they may be, truly become what they are. And what they are is just a means to focus our lives on God, and that's a reason to rejoice. Bless, praise, boast, rejoice, they're all practical ways that we can focus or we can praise God. And then David offers two more. They're there in verse 3. Well, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Magnify, what's that? Well, when you were a kid, you probably had the experience of sitting down and looking at a bug or something really small with a magnifying glass. And as we did, we saw that bug in a way we never saw that bug before. We saw all kinds of details in that bug, and it, suddenly I understood the bug better. It was fascinating. By looking through that magnifying lens, we suddenly understood the bug way better. And that's what magnifying is. We didn't make the bug any bigger. But by magnifying the bug, it gave us a more accurate perception of the bug. And our understanding of that bug grew. Likewise, when we magnify God, we're not making him any bigger. We can't change God in any way. But as we magnify God in our hearts, our understanding of him grows. And God becomes more and more prominent to us. Here's another example. My wife, Kelly, is a very pretty woman. And I'm not just saying that because she's back there. She is. I remember the first time I saw her, I thought, ooh, that's the prettiest girl I've ever seen. That's the God's honest truth. I'll look at her sometimes and go, man, she's just beautiful. But when I tell her that, I'm not making her any more beautiful. She is what she is, and I had nothing to do with it. But she's blessed, I hope, by hearing me tell her that I think she's beautiful. Similarly, when I magnify God and see him more and more as he really is, and I tell him, God, you're really awesome. My telling that, God, that doesn't make God awesome. He already was awesome. But Scripture says it does bless him. I know he's happy that I know him better because I know that's what he wants all along. That's what he wants from all of us, to know him, know him better. And that's what God wants us to get through magnifying him. And finally, there's the word exalt. Let us exalt his name together. The English word exalt comes from the Latin word exaltare, which means to lift up. You might recognize that root alt in words like altitude and altimeter. Psalm 99.5 tells us to exalt the Lord our God, bow low before his feet, for he is holy. To exalt God is to place God in the highest position of our lives. 
and higher than anything else in our lives. We exalt God by recognizing, recognizing he is higher than anything else. Anything in the universe, in terms of greatness, in terms of glory, in terms of anything else good and wonderful, he is the highest. But the last half of Psalm 99.5 is pretty important too. It gives us an additional way to exalt God by humbling ourselves, by bowing before him, recognizing how great God is, and humbly submitting our lives to him and bowing at his feet. That's exalting God. Here's one last thing I want us to notice about those last two examples of how we can praise God. Do you notice how David wants us to magnify and exalt God with others, with him? You catch that? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. David realizes, and he's pointing out an important truth. There is great power in all of us praising God together. David is saying, and he's absolutely correct, that praise is a team sport. Psalm 149.1 says, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. People, that's us. That's us right here and right now. We're the assembly of the saints. Private praise and praising God it has its, it does have real value. And it is important. But what a joy it is to praise God together with those who love him. That's why we sing together to start the service. That's why we sing to God to end the service. And when we do, when you do, and you really enter into worship, and you're letting your heart lead you in worship, and you hear the people next to you doing the same thing, really worshiping God, you feel the power, don't you? Corporate praise is powerful. And it's what we're called to do. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We're called to praise God everywhere in every way. We're called to worship with our actions as well as with our voices in our lives. Words that bless, words that praise, words that boast God about God, words that cause us to rejoice in and magnify and exalt God. And when we do, our lives are changed. When we do, our world is changed. When we praise God with all that we are, we're drawn away from the temptations of the sinful world, which are really just dangers and traps and pitfalls that pull us away from God. And we're drawn closer to God. And that's the whole point. That's the entire objective of our praise. Not to assuage some egotistical God's massive ego. That's not our God at all. And when we truly praise God, we see that. Because when we truly praise God, we're seeing God. We're magnifying Him and seeing Him better than we've ever seen Him before. When we see God for who He really is and how much He really loves us, our greatest desire is to be with Him. Him. When the world sees God like that, they're drawn to Him. That's the power of praise. That's why praise is such an awesome tool in forcefully expanding the kingdom of God in this time, in this place. Because when people see that God is there and God loves them, they are drawn to him. There was an elderly Christian woman who was advancing in her years. And as she got older, her age took a toll on her memory. But when she was a younger woman, she could recite hundreds of Bible verses. But as her health faded, so did her memory. And a time came when she could recite fewer and fewer Bible verses. And eventually she could just call, recall one. And she would say it over and over again. 2 Timothy 1.12 I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Ultimately, though, even those words slipped out of her mind. And as she grew frail and more frail and Ever closer to the end of her life, she lost almost all of her vocabulary except for six words, which she would repeat over and over again. The only six words she would say, what I have entrusted to him. What I have entrusted to him. Finally, as the hour of the woman's death approached, all she could say was one single word, and that's what she said, and it was her final word. And as she passed, she was saying that word. She was just simply saying, him. 
him. Him. He is the key to our praise. He is the reason for our praise. So we, as we come together to worship him, as we are giving thanks to him in the presence of others, we are letting our praise be the voice of our faith. Let all of our focus be on him. There is no higher praise. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving our voice a faith, our faith a voice. Thank you for giving us the ability to praise you out loud when we're alone and when we're together. Thank you for that. Now let, us, let it be a tool that we don't neglect. Let it be a tool we use every day, all the time. Let every breath we have be something that praises you. Lord, let us be consciously aware of your presence in our lives. Because if we are, all we can do is praise you. Lord, I pray that this people here, this congregation here today, people watching online, would search their hearts and search their minds and remember everything, every reason they have to praise you for their endless. And I pray that that praise would ooze out of them so that their faith is strengthened. So their, the voice of their faith becomes loud so others may hear. And we may bring others to the kingdom of God. Lord, that's our goal. That's what we want because that's what you want. We love you so much and we